But now we come to the speaker of the day, George Gilbert. Uh, as I previously mentioned, uh, George flew after that. He ran his own charter company, um, probably one of the longest running charter companies in Western Australia. Certainly uh, it was the last privately owned one, and I think he flew uh, <laughs> up until the age of about 75 or something like that. But anyway, it's a pleasure to have uh, George along today. And um, his good friend Ken Pittman is going to help him because Ken um, plays golf with him each week and they talk, talk, talk the whole time about aeroplanes. And uh, George, uh, sorry, uh, Ken also knows a bit about computers and he's made the PowerPoint display to go with the show today. So it's over to the pair of them, Ken Pittman and George Gilbert. Put your hands together. Thanks, Brian. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite a pleasure to be standing up before you. As I said, uh, George and I play golf, occasionally he beats me, and he's been telling me some fabulous stories over the years. He, uh, he learned to fly in the 1940s in the Air Force, in 1943. In fact, he was flying Spitfires the day I was born, 22nd of September 1943, and I had the pleasure of uh, going for a ride with him in the sharp end on his last flight, and he was 75 years of age and one day when he decided to give it away. So, um, and one of the reasons I've put the PowerPoint presentation together is I got access to all the photographs of the 79 squad in the museum, so there's quite a few that have not been seen before. And George is a little bit worried about this presentation, so I just said if he tries up, we'll flip across the photographs and you can jump up and ask questions. But he is a bit on the deaf side, so he might have to shout. So I hand over to George. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'll tell you all about my ref experience. I joined the RAF in 1941, went into camp at Summers in Victoria, south of Frankston, on the 1st of February 42, and stayed there till 20th of June 42. I was just cut from Mother's apron strings. We were given a hessian bag and told to fill it with straw to the right thickness for our mattress. They call it the pallias, no pallias. <laughs> And you had it over the right thickness, and uh, once you got used to it, it was very, very comfortable. We had a bad-tempered sergeant who taught us discipline, etc. We spent half a day in the classroom and another half on the playground, learning to march and rifle drill and all that. We had lessons on gyroscopes, altimeters, engines, taught how to assemble a revolver, and the theory of flight and all that sort of thing. At the end of four months, we had exams. The brainy airmen were to be navigators, the rest pilots and air gunners and radio operators, radio operators. Luckily, I was one to be a pilot. I was posted to two EFTs at Western Junction, north of Tasmania, on the 23rd of June to the 15th of September. It was winter time, snow on the ground and all that sort of thing. We enjoyed flying tiger moths, and I went solo in 7 hours 20 minutes, and I was assessed as average. <coughs> After that I was posted to Deniliquin in New South Wales on the 25th of September on Wirraways. It was a great jump from a 100 horsepower tiger to 600 horsepower wasp engine. Two pilots to an instructor, but I had the instructor to myself as the other trainee couldn't keep up and quit. Here again we spent half a day in the classroom and half a day flying, across countries and all that sort of thing. Whilst there I was supposed to embarkation depot, we were off to England uh, on January the 4th, uh, up to 31st of January. There was no ship so we were posted back to uh, Mildura to fly on back to Wirraways. I'm getting a bit mixed up here. Anyway, uh, the Mildura one went back onto Wirraways and uh, we did a lot of low flying, bombing, high level bombing. The high level bombing was a real tricky one. It leveled off at 10,000, over on your back, sight on the target, screaming down to 5,000 and battled like Billion to get out. And uh, this was 
I did quite well. I got an 87 and a 73 yards error. Also strafing on the rifle range in Wurraways, where our billets were painted with identification colours and we fired on a target, again starting from 2,000 feet onto a normal rifle range. And uh, they could tell how many bullets you got on the target. Our guns were set for 12 yard error, not error, <laughs> as many as you could get on the target. Uh, at Mildura I had a forced landing, uh, I was at 8,000 feet and the cockpit filled with smoke. I got half out of the cockpit when the smoke subsided. I was keen to get back and glide down to a paddock as big as the aerodrome. Pumped the wheels and flaps down and landed safely which was a big mistake because I could have killed myself if the plane had flipped over and didn't ever get out and it was not appreciated. I did a high altitude course at Melbourne University on the 30th of January 43 and then back to Wirrus at 2 OTU, night flying, high devil bombing, skip bombing and a conversion on the Kitty Hawks. Well the Kitty Hawk we sat in the cockpit the day before and worked out where everything was and your plan when you took off, etc. But running down the runway, opening the throttles with about 1,500 horsepower, the noise was terrific and the wind hit me on the back of the neck and pushed my head forward and uh, eventually got off, did a circuit and landed. One of the Chaps there did the same thing, he did a slow roll going downwind. The next day he was out in the tarmac and everybody kicked him in the backside. That was not, not appreciated. Uh, after doing all that <coughs> on Kitty Hawks, I expected to be transferred to a Kitty Hawks squadron, but I was posted to 79 squadron and converted onto Mark V Spitfires. And these were very, very different to Kitty Hawks. It was a very narrow cockpit. Your head hits the canopy and your feet hung in the space unless you hooked them up on these rudders. Uh, it was so tight that we couldn't even open a map or travel cross country. So whenever we went anywhere, we had a bow fighter and uh, formed on the bow fighter and he navigated and took his places. There are a couple of funny things happened in a Spitfire that we got a big photograph of the cockpit. Now that's the cockpit, well you'll notice that the uh, control column bends in the middle. You couldn't have one going right across because it hit your knees. The other thing was that your throttles mixed your pitch on the left where that red, red handle is. And when you took off, you had to change your hand from the cock, uh, throttles onto the control column and put the other one and pull the undercard up, which is down there. So most times you see a kitty or a Spitfire take off, it does a little wobble, and that was because you had to change hands. The other thing, the difference with the Spitfire was that uh, the boost was in pounds. We were used to inches. And uh, the brakes are on the control column there, were hand brakes. And the flaps were run by compressed air, as well as the brakes. And if you run out of air, you run out of runway, usually. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a, a very, very tricky aeroplane, but flying them, you only had to look where you wanted to go or whatever, and it just went there. It became a sort of a natural thing to fly. And uh, here again, a peculiar thing happens. They are gravity feed. There's no pumps on your fuel. So that if you have negative Gs, the engine stops. And so that you'll often see when you go into attack on pictures of Spitfire, they always go over on their back and down otherwise the engine would cut uh, with negative cheese. Uh, the main thing, a lot of times there you would uh, 
red out, black out, and uh, you could uh, adjust it, and uh, you could fly the plane on the on the stool quite well. And uh, they were very very nice to fly, except well against the kitty hawk had a, a much more comfortable cockpit with more uh, padded seats and all that. We sat on a uh, parachute and a dinghy, and we had the old Mayweather uh, survival things in which we had, you know, uh, fish hooks and things like that, that if you're down on the water, you had something to do. Uh, but it was, you were, by the time you were tied in with all these straps and sitting on a dinghy which was attached to your parachute, it wasn't terribly comfortable, and we went up to four and a half hours ferry. Well, to get any relief, you had to get on your left buttocks, and on your right buttocks is all you could do, because your shoulders touched the side, and the head was on top, and you could take your feet off the steps and hang them in midair, which didn't do them any good. But uh, with all that, they were a different plan to the Kitty Hawk, and also they had cannons and machine guns. Well, I went to tell you uh, before when talking about Wirralways, we had two guns in the Wirralway cockpit above the, con the instruments and we used to, when we fired them, all the cordite and everything came into the cockpit. But, uh, and you had, had to cock them and you also had a synchroniser underneath them, which if it didn't work, put a few bullets through the prop. A lot of them had a hole in the prop. But uh, that gets away from that. Uh, then we went to, oh, we were on our way up. We that, <laughs> Sydney, we had our guns adjusted to get that circle. And on the way from Sydney, we were going to Brisbane. And all of a sudden, the four of us, there were four youngest in the squadron, we realised that we were all virgins which was a very, very sad thing to do, to have. So we went into Brisbane to find out where the brothel was, but we were too shy to ask. <laughs> so anyway, went further up to Brisbane, up to Townsville, sorry, and there one of the officers came along to us and said, right, oh, fellas, we'll have to fix you up. Put your revolvers in your shirt and we're going into town. Well, that was seemed pretty good, so I went into Townsville, which was a very wild place at the time. All the services were there. And uh, lo and behold, we get into town, and there was a queue about half a mile long. <laughs> so we <clears throat> went away wondering, <laughs> which was terrible. <laughs> I'd never come back. Uh, Tell them about the man making a quit in the queue. Sorry? Tell them about the guy making a quit in the queue. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, one of the locals who was posted there, he used to get in the queue and work his way up to the front, and then uh, a yank would come along and buy it, buy his position for a hundred US dollars. <laughs> and uh, that's what he did all day, <laughs> making a fortune. <laughs> the Americans had plenty of money. Uh, they were up to. Anyway, from there we went to, to uh, Milne Bay, no, sorry, up to Port Moresby, over to Milne Bay, and there we were. Oh, there was one other thing that happened there. At Townsville, we all bought a, a dozen bottles of beer and put them in the wings. And uh, we went to Port Moresby, and there it was in the war zone, so they put a guard on the aeroplane and took us away looked after us for the night. Next morning, the guard came, put us in the aeroplane, and away we went to Milne Bay. Well, we thought, this is good, we can have a beer now, and some bugger pinched the lot. <laughs> there was not one bottle left. That's just true. And so for the next uh, nine, ten months, we didn't have a drink. Anyway, uh, then we went from Milne Bay to Good Enough Island which was uh, just been taken over from the Japs. Well, there we were all lined up, the aircraft and a squadron of P-38s came in. 
And they were beautiful silver just out of the States, well trained people we thought. Anyway, they reckon the Smithville looked very drab and down on the hill. They took us on, took one bloke on and said, we can have a little dog fight. Well, the P-38 wasn't in it. The uh, Spitfire could turn inside him, could go straight up and leave him. Anyway, that was quite a, a show. And one day, one of these P-38s came screaming in and hit the top of a tree with his belly tank. He, uh, you see the fuel will drop out and his engine stopped. Well, this bloke was supposed to be well trained, but he didn't change tanks, the engine didn't go again, and he turned away from his good motor and just went in vertically, which was a very sad thing, but uh, it was showed that they weren't as trained as well as we were. Not that we had a twin. <laughs> uh, there we go. Oh, and from there we went up to the Trobian Islands, a place called Carowina. And uh, this was on the halfway between Milne Bay and Rabaul, which was the big centre for the Japs. Anyway, we uh, had a beautiful place at Kurowina that was the Yanks looked after it and gave us cigarettes and chewing tobacco and all that sort of thing. But uh, one day the uh, OCB flight came to me and asked me kindly would I accompany him across to New Britain, do a weather recce and come back. So off we went and it was quite nice. We always flew right on the deck and uh, when we got to Gasmata, which was on the east side of New Britain. We went further up towards the ball, checked the weather and came back to Gasmata and headed back home. Well, there was a whopping big thunderstorm in front of us. We couldn't go over it and we had to just go under it and we were still on the deck flying along. And uh, we had a compass between our legs, but it was so rough and we couldn't even fly close to each other, we were doing half rolls, and the sea was spewing white, and things weren't very happy. Anyway, we kept going, and would you believe, we hit our little base on the nose, which was just a coral outcrop. Anyway, we put the aircraft away, and uh, I was walking home back to the mess, and the, the OC came up, and he said, I was just to tell him, saying, thanks for bringing me home. And he said, George, thanks for bringing me home. I'll never fly with anybody else but you. You are my number two. <laughs> so that was nice, and uh, it was a really, very good position to be in, to have a number two. Anyway, uh, and, and that's where what happened. Every time we went out, I was his number two. Anyway, one day we did a top flight over Rabaul with the bombers. Oh, I can tell you another story about how we became, had aerial supremacy. The um, Americans were based at Port Norsby, and on this day, the lightnings came uh, out to our place and stayed overnight, and they would take off in the morning, crack at dawn, and go to a ball, do a run over, and come straight back. Wouldn't mix it. So the Yanks worked out then that uh, the Japanese would have to go down and land. So then the B-25s went along and put bombs along their runways. So I waited another couple of hours and the high level bombers, and we're on top of them with the flying fortresses and the, what's the, a few of them. And they completely annihilated Rabaul. But that wasn't enough. Two days later, they did exactly the same thing again. On one of these flights coming back, a chap named Bert Tassiger lost his engine, and I was instructed <laughs> to stay with him and glide down so that we couldn't lose him. Once you go down the ocean there, they never find you. Anyway, I thought to myself, I've never been told how to get out of a Spitfire. And the CEO came up and said to Bert, out at 10,000 feet. 
So 10,000 people I was there and I looked over and his canopy went off and his head came up and the next thing it bunted and he went flying through there head over hills and the aeroplane went straight down to sea. Anyway, he uh, got out of his parachute in the water, got into his dinghy and we waited until we'd lose him occasionally in the swell but we kept check on him and eventually out came the must no, 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 no. the Catalina came out to rescue him and the Catalina crew said they would go anywhere if they put a spitfire on each wing. So out comes the Catalina and he sees the bloke in the water and he goes straight along into the water. Well, he hit the top of the first swell and went into the second and put his engines out. So there he was with no motors and uh, Bert was trying very hard to get into the Catalina, which he did. And the only trouble is they were seasick all night. And the next, oh, during the night, we sent out two PT boats and towed him back to base. And when he uh, eventually got back to our strip, the doors opened, water fell out, and Bert got out with just an American G-string. Lost a lot. And uh, <laughs> it was lucky to get back. Anyway, once, now we used to get bombed, okay, we got bombed six times, but one of the little stories was that a chap after we'd wiped out Revol, a Tony, which was an exact copy of it, Kitty Hawk, used to come in at the crack of dawn, run along the strip, drop a bomb and take off. Well, he did that twice and we didn't see him. The third time we had two Kitty Hawks and two Spitfires were patrolling up and down the beach. Well, he slipped in this time and they sighted him and they couldn't catch him. He was exactly the same speed, racing off home. Anyway, one of the blokes lifted up his cannons and let a few shells go and one landed on his wing. And that stopped him and that was the end of him. We don't know where he came from or who he was or whatever, which was a, he was a very bright fellow, really. That's my plane. I was the only Tasmanian in the squadron, so I had the Tasmanian Devil on the side. And uh, it was a very nice aeroplane. But anyway, one day, oh, there's oh, yeah, yeah. all the jobs I did. The last time you flew it? Uh, yes, well, uh, that's right, I flew it over Gaspar. Anyway, uh, while I was away, another pilot crashed it. There it is, he ran out of air, no brakes, and up over and upside down. Anyway, they sent me home for my birthday, and when I came back, I had a new Spitfire. And this time, that's it there. <laughs> this time they had an innovation in it that uh, when you had negative G's, the engine kept going because they put a big U-tube in the fuel line so that it had some fuel upside down. Anyway, uh, the new plane was very, very nice. After I was posted away, the CO, who I was number two to, he died four days later. So I often wonder whether I'm still with him. He would still be alive. But anyway, he died, which is a bloody shame. Anyway, the story of that plane there is when it's been rebuilt. Some people from New Zealand went up and got it out of the jungle. It was all overgrown and took it back to New Zealand to rebuild it. Anyway, a bloke named T, his initials were TB, came out and bought it and took it back to England to Duxford and they rebuilt it and it looks like oh, that's it being rebuilt. It still had the number on the back, JG891, which was the number it was given out of the factory. So anyway, it is now flying out of Duxford and uh, going very well. They, uh, um, yeah, and that's him.
that they had a, put a mod on the front. We had one of those air scoops, but we took them off because they made it more streamlined, but these these people built that one, which doesn't look very nice, I don't think. Anyway, you can see there, and they've also put two cameras, four cameras on instead of we only had two. But uh, that's the, uh, I got a mention in uh, the aeroplane and Spitfire books that uh, my claim to fame was that I flew that in New Guinea. Uh, and. Uh, that's about it. What can I talk about next? Questions? Oh, question. No, not, not too thick, thanks. <laughs> Any questions about Spitfires? Uh, anyway, I finished up like, when I, the war was over. I came home, and after a couple of weeks, I said, I want to go back in, in the Air Force. I rang up the Air Force. And they say, so does everybody else who wants to go back into the Air Force. Because I, I was then an FO, I'd been through the ranks. Oh, well, there's one little picture, because it's packed up with the, the hat on it. No one. Uh, there's a picture there. Oh, that's, that's a uh, picture of us at Kurowina. That's me there. All the rest of the blokes are not with us. That's the same. That's a stone out at Ulamalata where we formed the squadron on a whopping big paddock uh, at the station. And that's there, we put a plaque on the rock there to say that's where we began. And there's very few there alive, there's only me in the middle and this chap on the right are still alive today. Which, uh, there's only three of us left in the squadron originally. Uh, uh, that's the ground crew, the bloke on the left was engines, the bloke and the bloke who's he's actually cleaning my revolvers, armaments, and the bloke here was airframes. That was the, my crew. Uh, this is a story when 79 Squadron were based at Pierce and the introduction of the Hawk 127. They were not, <laughs> not a very good picture. The bloke second from me on the left there was a DFC, but he's died since, and the others are all still going. The bloke with the bow tie was the CO of 79 Squadron out at Pierce. And the bloke on his right is the brother of the present governor of, Tes of Western Australia, Mick Michael. And he runs the Fighter Squadrons Association. There was one thing I was going to say. Now there's another reunion in Sydney, and there again there's only two of us left out of that lot, which is very sad. There was one, oh, I used to go to Melbourne, so I was a bit disjointed, and uh, do a work in the, of the March of 79 Squadron. I did that quite a year, a few years in a row. That's me over there on the left. The bloke who pranked my aeroplane is that bloke there with the funny hat. That's right. <laughs> a bloke named Grinlington. Anyway, it was... Oh, no. <laughs> That's me giving a lecture to some children out at uh, Mount Pleasant Primary School just before Anzac Day. They wanted to know all about the war, etc., etc. There's one there with a forage cap with a white front, so I probably can't see it. Anyway, we all, the air crew had a little white front on their hats, which was distinguishing between everybody else. And the only problem with that is we went to an army where army camps were, they said, don't touch those blokes, they're in infectious diseases. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that's showing a Spitfire being taxi. We had to have a bloke on his wing to show you where you're going because he couldn't see uh, the front. And the other thing behind that engine, which was the Rolls Royce Merlin, the next thing back is a tank, a bulletproof tank, and that was our main tank. This plane's got a belly tank. and. Uh, so that's why the nose got longer and longer and longer. 
and we, uh, or one trip, we were going up to uh, <coughs> interception. Uh, halfway, the CO said, "Drop your belly tanks." So we all dropped our belly tanks, and the medic, my engine wouldn't work. Or oh, well, very half and uh, he said, the CO kept saying, "Catch up, George, catch up," and I couldn't. And he said, "Well, go home." <laughs> And they left me, and there I was in a terrible <laughs> part of the world, frightened, didn't have anybody to look after me, and I went home. Anyway, the further faster, the further lower I got, the more the engine went, and I went as fast as I could with well, a full throttle. <laughs> when the engine going well, because it was getting air, what had happened, the main tank had got a little blockage on the air to let the air in and I was going so fast I got to uh, Kirawina had to go around four circles to slow down to get my wheels down <laughs> I, I, was, <laughs> I don't know what speed I was doing but it was bloody fast <laughs> uh, that's uh, on a one on our way so up at the uh, top of Cape York a strip runs into the water and we, we stopped there for the night. Uh, oh yes, uh, I told you about that chap who shot that Tony down. Well he died two couple of days later well, on an aircraft accident similar to that. That's the, the CO's aeroplane where he, got, he took off and took, turned sideways the next plane killed, took all his cockpit away. It was a terrible way to go. And uh, he's buried up at Los Negros. Now, eventually we finished up at Los Negros. That's him in the middle there, Max Spot, with two of his crew. Uh, very nice fellow. But they had a lot of pranks, but <laughs> a lot of them went after I left. I, uh, they carried on the squadron and we were up at Los Negros in the Admiralty Islands on our last trip. And uh, there, again, the American bombers were based and we were there for a top cover and look after them when they came back. Well, they were going over to the Philippines, bombing the Philippines from this part of the world, which had Japanese on this Los Negros and they were still fighting on the airstrips when we landed, which was very concerning. Up there I got a dose of dengue fever and the doctor who we called the pill roller gave me about a dozen pills and put me in the, we lived then in American, oh, what do you call them? Uh, I can't think, anyway, in the morning after I felt a lot better and there was a pool of sweat in the bottom of, in a hammock. We lived in the hammocks with a fly net and a waterproof roof, uh, which wasn't, uh, the dinghy was a terrible thing. We always, the doctor was a terrific fellow, though, and he uh, took a lot of supplies up in his uh, ambulance, and one of them was a lot of capstan cigarettes. And uh, they were useless up in that country. They, you couldn't suck them. They were, the humidity was far too great. Uh, I think I've just about covered everything. We've run out of time. We've plenty more photographs, but uh, we've been told to chop. That's it. Now, uh, anyone like to ask any terrible questions? <laughs> what do you say, Ken? How did you get on for map reading? Ma I never, never had to do any. We were, everywhere we went, we had an escort. Or a, <coughs> we had once a mosquito, a bow fighter. Uh, bombers used to take us everywhere we wanted to go. So map reading wasn't in it. Uh, we couldn't even open a map in the, the cockpit was only that wide. And they couldn't open a map or, or read the map or anything. Oh, it was MacArthur that requested a Spitfire squadron to look after his bombers. He'd heard what they did in England, and uh, we, were, we were sent right up there where all the others were in Darwin, the uh, three squadrons of Spitfires in Darwin. That's our CO. He'd, 
he was a DFC and bar, whatever, whatever, flew in three squadron in the Middle East uh, on Kitty Hawks. But that's him again with his crew. Uh, that's one of the pilots, Warren Napier. All planes were spread around the countryside. Uh, that's us uh, formating on the on the Liberator. Uh, okay.